Hey friends, we're gonna do something just a little bit different today. I thought it would be a really cool idea to put together a compilation of some videos highlighting the most dark and morbid episodes of Hey Arnold. But first, I just really need to talk with you guys for a little bit. I've got to be honest with you all, I've been feeling kind of defeated recently. I don't want to go into too much detail or make a big stink about it, but something happened that kind of took a lot of the wind out of my sails here on YouTube. It sucks a lot, but it is what it is, and I literally can't do anything about it. As a result, my video schedule has kind of fallen to pieces. I made good progress and was working ahead of myself, then stuff happened, and it's like someone pushed a nice stick in my bike tire causing me to faceplant. With that being said, I'm still like making videos and stuff, but unfortunately I fell really far behind on my super thanks shoutouts because of this whole whirlwind of nonsense. So I figured we'd have a little bit of fun and catch up for a while in the spirit of chugging along full steam ahead. Though super thanks are an excellent way to help me keep the lights on when stuff like this happens, as always I don't want anyone to feel obligated to donate. However, if you want to share a message with the rest of the class, feel free to donate directly to me with the super thanks button down below. Because I fell so far behind on them, I have a bunch to catch up on, so let's see what we got here. First up, we have Harpsifiz, who donated $10 and said, I listened to your Hey Arnold videos while embalming. This is for the Herald video. I really liked it a lot. Man, we're just coming right out the gate swinging here, aren't we? Sounds like you work for a funeral home, and that is awesome. In the last Super Thanks Sunday segment that I did, I remember giving a shout out to my audio only gang because I appreciate you all a ton. However, I never really thought about all of the different random things that you all could be doing while you're listening to this. With that being said though, hey audio only gang, uh, if, if I could just pester you guys for a second when you have time. If you don't mind, could you pretty please leave me a comment letting me know what kind of wacky stuff you do while listening to my videos? I'm genuinely curious, and honestly, I think our friend Harpsifiz might take the cake for the most unique audio only gang activity. Seriously though, thank you so much for your generous donation, Harpsy Fizz. I really appreciate you. I'm glad you like the long form Hey Arnold videos. They really are where my true passion resides. Next up, we have CarmelCat96, who donated $5 and said, New to the channel, and I've been watching nothing but your videos for the last two days. Love your work. Thank you so much for your support, Carmel Cat. I really appreciate you checking out my channel and for being a part of my little community here on YouTube. I can't thank you enough for being a new subscriber. Next up, we have, and I'm so sorry, I'm probably gonna butcher this, Lavi Stunsange4541, who donated $10 and said, been a fan for a while and love your content and the research that you put into your videos, especially the Dark Side Of series and sharing in collective nostalgia. Thank you so much for your kind words, my friend. That just really means the world to me. The Dark Side Of is a series that I genuinely hold close to my heart, and honestly I'm not sure which show is going to get the Dark Side Of treatment after Hey Arnold is all wrapped up. I love making the long form videos, and I'm so excited for the future of that series. I also really appreciate you pointing out the research that I do. That means so much to me. Sure, sometimes I miss a deleted scene that I would have learned about if I dug through Wikipedia or something like that, but my approach to research is a lot different than just perusing a wiki and calling it my video. With that being said, thank you so much for recognizing that friend. I really, really appreciate it. Next up, we have Sakura Chan Kuria 11, who donated $2 and said, Mmm, heya there, dusky dear. It's nice to see you updating your videos on your own schedule and such. I love hearing your review and summaries of your opinions and such. Both Cat Dog and Courage the Cowardly Dog being my top favorites to which we can all identify and relate to. Please keep up with your vids, they always make my day. It was slightly exhausting for me today, but I'll definitely watch it a little later after a short nap. But still, keep them up either way. Here's a friendly donation to you too. P.S. Just watched your video here. Great video as always. They make my days and such too. Aw, thank you so much for being a subscriber and for watching my videos, my friend. It makes my heart so happy knowing that my videos make so many people's day. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it, and I hope that the nap was fantastic. Next up, we have Starvin Marvin 1200 who donated $2 and said, Pee pee poo poo kitty caca. LOL, I hope this is read next Sunday. Anyways, dope videos, glad you were able to switch to a career that isn't so heavy on the mind. 
let's get this man to 500k before 2024 ends. Marvin, you donated to me. Of course I'm gonna read your message to the rest of the class. As long as it's not offensive, I don't mind. Honestly, man, I wish more people would leave funny comments like this. Thanks for your donation, dude. The career switch was a much needed act of self-preservation on my part, and honestly, I'm so glad that I did it when I did. I appreciate your support, my friend. Up next, we have Wrestling T-Shirt Guy, who donated $5 two times and said the second you mentioned that you had kids, I had to donate. Would love to get you as a guest on my dad-centered show, The Dad World Order Podcast. Honestly, that sounds like fun. I've never been on a podcast before, but I'll totally consider it. Being a dad is something that's really important to me, and I wouldn't be the person that I am today if it wasn't for my kiddos. Thank you so much for your donation, my friend, and if you want to shoot me an email, we can totally talk. It's in the description box down below. Next up, we have True Fenrir, who donated $10 and said, I've been watching you since your first Dark Side of Hey Arnold episode. Hey Arnold was one of my favorite Nick shows. Also loved Rugrats, CatDog, Rocco, etc. I love getting my nostalgia itch scratched. I always look forward to your videos. You deserve the recognition for all the incredibly hard work you do. Thank you. And you, True Fenrir, are so incredibly kind. Thank you very much for your donation and for all of your support. It blows my mind to think that my first Dark Side of Hey Arnold video dropped almost two years ago now. That video completely changed how I approach my content here on YouTube, and it was definitely one of my all-time greatest shower ideas. Thanks again for your support these last two years, and cheers to many more years, hopefully. Up next, we have Axe, who donated $5 and said, Thank you for doing this. It ain't much, but I don't mind supporting you and your family. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much for your donation, Axe. That $5 helps me a ton, my friend. In all reality, you can say $5 ain't much, but to me, dude, that's massive. You take the time out of your life to earn that money, and the fact that you appreciate my videos enough to donate some of your own hard-earned money to me and my family just speaks volumes. I can't thank you enough for your support, and I'm so, so thankful that you enjoy my videos, and I genuinely appreciate you. Next up, we have Combo Wombo, who donated $25 and said, I love watching your videos, and you are easily my favorite favorite YouTuber. You're the best, man. First of all, thank you so much for your support, my friend. It blows my mind to think that I'm someone else's favorite YouTuber. Words can't explain how thankful I am that I have such an amazing community of great people who appreciate my work. I put so much love and energy into my videos, and I hope that you know that your support literally means the world to me. Thanks again, Combo Wombo. You're the best. Next up, we have Peaberry, who donated $5 just to say thanks. And to that, of course, I say thank you so much, Peaberry. You're an absolute legend. I'm glad that you enjoy my videos, and I appreciate you a whole bunch. Next up, we have Doug Couch, who donated $6 across three different super thanks to say thanks. I love your series. Keep it up. Have you ever thought about doing Wild Thornberry's videos? I really like that show as well. Thanks again for your support, Doug. The Wild Thornberries is a show that's actually been on my list of video ideas for a long time, but I've just never really pulled the trigger on it. What do you guys think? Should we check out the Wild Thornberries? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks again for your support, Doug. You are the man. Next, we have Sage Arter, who donated $5 and said, Your passions shine through in all of your work. Here's a fiver to help you and your family. If you're open to suggestions, I'd love to see you talk about the all grown up episode, Lucky 13. For the first time, I genuinely felt bad for Angelica and she took the high road. Thank you so, so much, Sage Arter. I appreciate you, my friend. I'm always open to suggestions and I'll definitely add that to my list. All Grown Up was a great show and I remember that episode very well. I really, really want to thank you for recognizing the passion in my videos, and I appreciate your donation. When it starts to rain on the YouTube landscape a little bit, it makes me very happy to know that I have such a fantastic community of amazing people who really care about me and what I do. I know that I probably sound like a broken record, but I hope you all know how thankful I am to have you here. I'm really lucky to be able to build this community, and every day I take a moment to reflect on how much I appreciate where I'm at. 
Also guys, fair warning, I have like 10 more super thanks shoutouts to get through, but I figured I'd save them for next week in the spirit of spreading them out a little more and not dragging this out longer than it has been. So keep in mind, if you're looking forward to a super thanks shoutout that you've already paid for, just be a little patient please, I got you next week, I promise. Again, thank you so much to everyone who donated via super thanks here on YouTube, and again, if you can't donate or you simply don't want to, thanks for being here, because you watching this video, liking, and even leaving a comment helps me grow as a creator and reach many more people. Thanks again guys, and I hope you enjoy this compilation. In case you missed the memo, spooky season is in full force on this channel. I love Halloween and I love creepy episodes of shows, and I've been planning videos for Halloween since March of this year. If you did miss it, I'll leave a link to my last spooky season video in the description of this one so you can check it out after you watch this one. To say that I'm totally hyped for the Halloween season would be an absolute understatement. I am 10 out of 10 pumped, dare I say ecstatic about spooky season. Why am I so hyped you may ask? Good question. I have a plethora of memories from my childhood of seeing scary or creepy episodes of shows that would leave me shook. Bear in mind, I was the kind of kid that was afraid of everything, but that rush I would get from watching a scary show was just ridiculous. The feeling of waking up in the middle of the night after a nightmare about a show that I had watched was kind of bittersweet. At the time, I hated it because I was terrified, but the adrenaline rush of waking up with my heart pumping out of my chest was absolutely mind-blowing. It's a rush that's almost hard to explain. As someone who's almost like the exact opposite of an adrenaline junkie, it's a feeling that I truly enjoy because I get that fun adrenaline rush without having to actually put myself in any danger. There's something really tantalizing about spooky cartoons because when you're watching a children's cartoon, the last thing you expect is to get spooked, and some of these shows do a really good job of freaking you out and shaking you to your core. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we are looking at a creepy episode of one of our favorite 90s Nicktoons, Hey Arnold. Before we get into it, do me a solid and drop a like on this video if you enjoy it, and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it promotes this video. Hey Arnold was a show that is really special. It never really portrayed situations that were unlike real life. Whereas Rugrats was about talking babies, Rocco's Modern Life was about talking animals, and Ah Real Monsters was about real monsters, Hey Arnold was about normal kids dealing with normal situations. It was pretty rare for Hey Arnold to deviate from real world issues, but when they did, things would get pretty intense. This is one of those few episodes where things got really intense. The episode we're looking at today gave me full-on nightmares when I was a little kid. It's an episode that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Specifically, we are looking at Season 1, Episode 8. The Haunted Train the episode begins with a menacing glimpse at the haunted train emitting smoke as the shot dissolves into Grandpa Phil buying himself, Arnold, and Gerald some ice cream from the Jolly Ollie Man. Arnold and Gerald tell Grandpa about how bored they are because they've played literally every single game in the house. At that exact moment, a subway train drives by which prompts Grandpa to tell the story about how he used to work for the railroad. Now, I put quotes around that because as you probably know already, Grandpa Phil is known to stretch the truth in his stories quite a bit. He tells the story of how about 40 years ago, Engine 25 was heading back to the station when the conductor went mad and drove the train off the tracks. Legend has it, no one ever saw the conductor or the train ever again. To the very most southern point. You mean? That's right. Wow! He drove all the way to the South Pole? No! He drove the train straight down to the fiery underworld! Every year on the anniversary of its last ride, the train comes back to the station to pick up unsuspecting passengers who are hypnotized and drawn in by a blinding white light only to be met with a peculiar smell. I'll tell you what it is. It's the smell of... Socks? No, fire and brimstone. Then, the passengers hear ear-splitting, shrieking, inhuman music, and finally, the train enters the zone of darkness, where they feel the heat of the flames and are met by the red, fiery demon himself. You know what tonight is, don't ya? It's the 40th anniversary! I'd sure hate to be at the old train station tonight! Oh, the one on 53rd past Livingston! You know, next to the tire shop there. 
Arnold, Gerald, and Helga make plans to meet at the train station that night, one hour after the streetlights go out. When they get there, we find that the train station has been completely abandoned and boarded up. This place looks like no one has stepped foot in it for years. The three kids wait around until the clock strikes midnight to see if the train shows up. To pass the time, Arnold and Gerald have a nice little duet with Arnold on the harmonica and Gerald singing. They say he lost his mind, went crazy on that day, ran his train wide off the tracks and drove it straight to... Hey! Helga gets angry from waiting for so long and having to listen to their song. As she's popping off, we hear the eerie sound of a train honking in the distance. The building starts to shake as we see none other than Engine 25 approaching the station on the 40th anniversary of the day that it flew off the tracks and departed for the fiery underworld. It comes to a screeching halt and stops in front of them. We're the victims of forces we can't possibly comprehend. Just like that, Arnold, Helga, and Gerald find themselves alone on the old dilapidated train car that looks as if it hasn't been maintained in 40 years. They try to leave, but the doors slam shut before they can get out. As the train drives away, they are greeted by none other than the putrid scent of rotten eggs, just like in the story. Do you hear what I hear? You mean that horrible ear-splitting and possible inhuman music? Helga, who, might I add, was a skeptic and didn't believe in any of this, starts to completely freak out and lose what little cool she had to begin with. As the train continues to go down the bumpy tracks, the lights go out as the kids prepare to face what Grandpa Phil called the Zone of Darkness. Oddly enough, Brainy shows up out of nowhere, but he doesn't stay for long as the kids open the door and straight up yeet his ass out of the moving train. As soon as they close the door, the kids are met with fire in a scene that looks identical to what Grandpa Phil described in his story. Arnold gets the bright idea to grab the fire hose out of an emergency box on the train wall. Now, can we just talk about this for a sec? I'm not even going to question the fact that there's a full-blown fire hose on a passenger train seemingly connected to the wall, which in and of its own leads me to a plethora of other questions. I'll accept the cartoon logic of that one and humor the idea. Rather, how the hell is this going to help anything? Let's just pretend for a second that they actually did ride a train into the depths of the earth. How would spraying water help at all? I get that Arnold had to act quick and work with what he had at the moment, but spraying a fire hose into the depths of the earth kind of sounds like putting a child-sized band-aid on a bowie knife-sized stab wound. Regardless, rant over. The doors open up and Arnold sprays the fiery demon directly with the hose, but we come to find out that it isn't a demon after all, and it's actually a blue-collar worker just doing his job. Hey! What did you do that for? At that exact moment, a guy whose chin looks suspiciously like a pair of testicles barges into the train car, saying that only steel mill workers are allowed on this train. Arnold and his friends come to the realization that they aren't in the fiery underworld on a haunted train, rather that they are at a steel mill on a train provided for relief workers. This train isn't haunted? Haunted? Oh no, not that story again. This train is for relief workers. The ball-chinned conductor is quick to answer all of the different signs from the story. The sulfur, which led to the rotten egg smell. The old wiring, which led to the lights going out. The music! I've never heard anything so horrible! It was like torture. I thought my eardrums were going to explode. Uh, well, I suppose some people don't appreciate the polka. Okay? Does that explain everything? I don't know if you noticed that awkward change in animation there, but just to be completely clear, that wasn't a weird jump cut from me editing or anything like that. Midway through that guy's sentence, the background that had absolutely no fire just spontaneously combusted and started burning. It's like the animators realized partway into the scene that they forgot to include fire, but it was just a little bit too late for them to turn back, so they just threw it in there once they realized, knowing that of course none of the kids watching this show would even notice. I hate to nitpick the 
these old beloved nostalgic cartoons, but one other thing drove me nuts with this scene. Just listen to the weird change in audio at this clip. Let's get you kids on the right train home. Jeez. That last line there sounded like a completely different voice actor. It sticks out like a sore pink thumb, and I just find it hilarious that they threw it in. It was completely unnecessary too, like he could have said that entire line without that awkward Jeez. at the end, and it wouldn't have made even the slightest difference. But they did it anyways. After the kids leave, Grandpa Phil picks them up from the train station. A fire extinguisher against the fires of the underworld, eh? <laughs> yeah, Grandpa, I thought the same exact thing, like a kid-sized band-aid on a Bowie knife stab wound. There is no haunted train. Well, now I didn't say that. But then we see the Packard drive away as Brainy is sitting on a bench watching Engine 25 pass by. Only this time, things are just a bit different. Sometimes late at night, you can hear the whistle wail. With a squeaky screechy sound, like a wind gone off the rail. And up in the smoky clouds, you can almost recognize the ghost of a crazy engineer with fire silver eyes. Man. I don't know what it is about that ending, but to this very day, it leaves me feeling generally uneasy. As a kid, I would straight up dread watching this episode whenever it played on Nickelodeon. It's a good episode, don't get me wrong, but there's just something about that ending that whenever I watched it as a kid made me feel complete dread in the pit of my stomach. Something about hearing the conductor's deep voice singing and seeing him take that train off the rails always left me feeling straight up terrified and completely unnerved. Like I said before, there's just something something truly tantalizing about getting spooked by a children's cartoon, since odds are that's the last place you'd expect a good scare to come from. There is one final thing that I can't help but wonder, and that would be how did Grandpa Phil know? Did he actually work for the railroad at one point, or did he hear the story from a steel mill worker? And like, what are the odds of all this happening? Like sure, the smell of rotten eggs can be expected since he knew that the train went to the steel mill, but the odds of the lights actually going out just like in his story are actually kind of low. Even lower, though, are the odds of the inhuman music that was actually the conductor playing the accordion. How did he know that all of those things were going to happen? Or was it just dumb luck? I guess we might never know the answer to those questions, but I do know that this is a top shelf episode of Hey Arnold, and I'd love to hear your guys' feedback down in the comments. Let me know what you thought of this video, and if there are any other spooky episodes you'd like me to cover while we are still in spooky season. No guarantees, but I'll definitely keep an eye out for your guys' recommendations. Be sure to drop a like if you enjoyed this video and give praise to the YouTube algorithm that it hopefully promotes this video to everyone else. And as always, thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. So I gotta come clean with you guys, I am frustrated. Spooky season didn't go exactly how I had planned. I had, and I still have, a long list of videos that I wanted to make for spooky season, but all of that came to a grinding halt when I made one specific video. I hate to spill the beans before it goes live, but at this point I'm not sure if it ever will go live to be honest with you, so it's whatever. I made a really good video about the 90s show Goosebumps, and as usually happens with my videos, it got copyright claimed. That's just the nature of the beast within the genre genre of videos that I prefer to make, however, usually I put in a dispute and within a few days the copyright claim gets dropped as my videos fall within the umbrella of fair use here in the United States. This Goosebumps video though was different. I put in my claim and it sat open for like two weeks before the claimant made a decision on it. Within that time frame of waiting for that claim to get resolved, I completely recorded and uploaded my last video which was about the Rocket Power Halloween special. Of course, the Rocket Power video got claimed too so I put in a dispute like I normally do and that one even sat for about a week before it was finally dropped and I could allow the video to go live. However, in that time, the copyright claim on the Goosebumps video was decided on and
and the claimant decided to uphold the claim and keep that video blocked. From there, I put in an appeal to have it reviewed by the claimant again, since it definitely falls under that umbrella of fair use I was talking about. However, that appeal that I put in nearly two weeks ago as of me recording this still is not resolved. So from here it's gonna go one of two ways, either they dismiss my appeal and uphold their decision and my channel will get a copyright strike, or they'll drop the claim and the video will be able to go public finally. I'm telling you guys this for two reasons. First of all, if I do get a copyright strike again, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to post for a week or two, so if I disappear for a while, that's probably why. The other reason is that if that video does see the light of day ever, the context in which it was recorded is as if we were still in the middle of spooky season when we are starting to kind of wind down from spooky season now. That'll make a lot more sense if you guys actually end up seeing it, but honestly it's just frustrating because I had a ton of more videos I wanted to make for spooky season, but when the copyright claims came to a grinding halt after me being used to them being resolved in a few days, it kind of discouraged me. It's really just frustrating to put so much time and effort into my videos and for copyright claim decisions to be made by the company that holds the copyright instead of being decided by a neutral party such as YouTube for example. But it is what it is, I don't want to sit here and ramble about fair use and how frustrated I am with the whole process, instead we're just going to get right back into the swing of things and just keep on going. I also wanted to say thank you so much to all of my subscribers, as of the time of me recording this we're about to hit 27,000 subs and I can cannot thank you guys enough for supporting me. I sincerely appreciate all of you being a part of my YouTube journey. Now, there are a few crucial spooky season videos that I really wanted to make, so we're going to continue on that path for just a little while longer. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we are looking at an episode that I saw a ton of you guys requesting in the comments of one of my other spooky season videos. An episode of Hey Arnold that many of you, the fans, have dubbed as the real scary episode of all time. The Headless Cabbie On the night of a full moon, Arnold, Gerald, Sid, Stinky, and Harold are having a sleepover at Arnold's place. The five of them are taking turns telling scary stories. He cut off the monkey's head and sewed it on the cat's body and invented Monkey Cat! Of course, the thought of a monkey having its head sewn onto a cat is none too scary to the group, much to Stinky's disappointment. It's a banana-eating, milk-drinking horror monster! Monkey Cat! That's not scary, that's stupid! Next is Arnold's turn to tell a scary story. He tells of a hundred years ago, in the city park on a foggy night, a cabbie was driving his cab when he got hailed by a very strange and peculiar woman. I've been quite upset and I wanted to clear my head. You see, I lost my Scotty dog a few weeks ago and I'm still hoping to find him. Might we ride about the park? Yes, mum. Due to the extreme cold, the lady offers the cabbie her scarf, which he gladly accepts. As they continue riding, the woman hears what she believes to be the sound of her dog barking in the distance. She urges him to go faster as they eventually catch up to her dog and end up speeding up to chase it. They follow the dog into a tunnel. Watch out! It was a man with a huge golden hook for an arm! And they barely missed him. He swerved out of the end of the tunnel and off the main road and down a steep hill. They keep riding, chasing the dog down the hill, going faster and faster, and the lady looking more and more evil as time passes. When suddenly, the scarf that the cabbie is wearing gets caught on a low-hanging branch. The horse kept pulling the carriage, only now the reins were held by... The Headless Cabbie! <laughs> okay, so as creepy as this is, I need to point out a few things that just make absolutely no sense. Watch this clip again. You can clearly see the shadow of the scarf as it's ripped in half. However, when we see the headless cabbie drive away, the scarf is still completely intact hanging from the tree branch. Furthermore, to the obvious, a scarf would be incapable of completely decapitating someone. Also, if it did decapitate him, his body wouldn't just continue to operate as the headless cabbie. But hey, who am I to destroy an urban legend in a children's cartoon with facts and logic? To this very day, when the fog comes down on quiet autumn night, you can still hear the barking of the demon Scotty Dog. The story leaves Arnold's friends shook, especially Harold. Stinky decides that they should go out into the night to get some ice cream, to which Harold adamantly protests. Meanwhile, Harold's chin line is just miraculously going through his hand, 
Gotta love that old school 90s animation. As the friends walk out into the night to get some ice cream, I can't help but notice that Stinky is shamelessly rocking his nightgown and sleep hat in public while his friends are dressed in normal attire. Of course, the boys decide to cut through the city park to get there. Well, can we take some other way? It's the fastest Come, way. Don't be a baby. Okay, I'll go but only because I'm really, really hungry. As they walk through the foggy park, Harold begins to freak out as they're approached by a little Scotty dog, just like in the story. Ain't nothing to be scared of. No, 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 it's a demon Scotty dog. Don't touch it. It'll put a spell on us. We'll all wind up with our heads cut off. You just gotta love how Stinky is really committing to the fit by rocking his bear claw slippers. Respect the drip. As they keep going through the park, they get freaked out by what sounds like a horse trotting down the cobblestone path, but it turns out it's just Eugene practicing for his clog dancing class in the foggy park in the middle of the night. Gives me the same vibes as Brainy being in the haunted train in my last Hey Arnold video. Makes very little sense, but okay, we'll accept it. Oh, I hate this! First the dog, then Eugene! This whole sleepover is scaring me to death! Let's get out of this park and get some ice cream now, please! The group treks on and approaches the same tunnel from the story. Harold is absolutely petrified, but with some encouragement from Arnold, he presses on. <laughs> As the group runs away, Arnold stops and tries to convince everyone that it's all just a coincidence, but just then, Stinky notices a red scarf identical to the one from the story hanging from a tree branch up above the path. Arnold tries to rationalize it as everyone just keeps freaking the hell out. It's just an old scarf. There's nothing weird going on here. Eugene, will you please stop clogging? I'm not doing anything. What is it, boy? As the boys turn to run away, they get stopped by a familiar face. Turns out that it isn't the headless cabbie, but it's just Ernie from the boarding house. But who's that lady laughing? That's what no lady! That's what's me! Mr. Wynn? Yes! I have a very creepy laugh! Can we get out of here now? Ernie gives the boys a ride to the ice cream shop and takes them back home as he heads back out into the night. Apparently, the construction business wasn't paying the bills, so he decided to moonlight as an old-time cabbie. As he approaches the park again, we see him pick up a lady who seems awfully similar to the one from the story. I lost my Scotty dog a few weeks ago, and I'm still hoping to find him. It's so cold out. Won't you wear this scarf? Oh, thanks, lady. It is pretty cold out tonight. <laughs> So, as someone pointed out in the comments of my last Hey Arnold video, the ending of this episode is straight up dark and chilling. The obvious implication being that Ernie faces the same fate as the cabbie from the story. Earlier in this episode, Arnold claims that the urban legend was one that was told to him by his grandpa, but when they get to the park, they saw the dog, they saw the scarf, and they saw the guy at the end of the tunnel who looked almost identical to the man with the golden hook arm. What are the odds that grandpa made up that story and the boys just so happened to experience some of what he said? It's eerily similar to that haunted train episode from my last Hey Arnold video. Grandpa made up a story about the haunted train, and when they went to investigate, they experienced everything that Grandpa said down to a T. Sometimes, you might start to wonder if Grandpa Phil might just know more than he's leading on. But, what do you think? Are you a believer that this is the scariest episode of Hey Arnold? Can you think of one maybe scarier than this one? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love to see your guys' feedback. Drop a like on this video if you enjoyed it and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it promotes this video. And as always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Happy October, everyone. Spooky season has a officially begun and I'm happy to be coming at you with a video that has been pretty much an entire year in the making. Last year, if I recall correctly, I made two spooky season videos about Hey Arnold. 
One was about the haunted train, and the other one was about the headless cabbie. If you missed out on those videos, well, that sucks, but I'll link them down in the description so that you can check them out after you're done watching this one. They turned out fantastic, if I do say so myself, and I'm sure that you're gonna dig them. But in the comments of both of those videos, I came across multiple people telling me that neither of those were the scariest episodes of Hey Arnold. The one that a lot of people said was the scariest episode may actually come as a surprise to you. Or maybe it won't. We'll see. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're going to check out what many of you have hailed as the all-time scariest episode of Hey Arnold, Ghost Bride. This episode is one that I look back on with mixed emotions. I remember it being a great episode, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't shake me to my core as a kid. Let's see if it holds up now like it did back then. In the beginning, we see all of the kids walking past the cemetery while Harold is just freaking out because the cemetery is full of dead people. Stinky remarks that Harold better get used to it because they'll probably end up being buried there someday. Rather dark take from our boy Stinky, but hey, we'll take it. Harold says that hopefully that's going to be far in the future, but Sid responds by saying, unless you end up like the ghost bride, which naturally ends up prompting Gerald to jump right into one of his flawless urban legends. You mean you've never heard the sad, tragic, and horrifying tale of the ghost bride? Go ahead, Gerald. I know that story! It's my favorite story! Come on, let me tell it! You may know the story, Curly. But we all know Gerald is the keeper of the tale. So Whoa. Gerald's gonna tell it. But I know it too! Come on, Gerald, 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 Gerald tell it! Gerald. Gerald tells them the story of a woman who lived 80 years ago and was madly in love and was counting down the days until she would be married. Her fondest dream would be that they always love each other. The day of her wedding, her husband-to-be skipped out and left her at the altar. She found out that he ran off and fell in love with her sister, and the very next day, her sister and fiancé got married to one another, leaving her in scorn. The night of their honeymoon, the woman put on her wedding dress and grabbed a giant axe. She went to their house, right into their room, and this happened. But they never saw the terrible event coming. And the police came. They found her sitting in the rocking chair next to the bodies, rocking herself and smiling while she hummed the wedding march. Then in horror, they could only watch as she jumped from her chair and leaped out the window, resulting in her demise. Now, every year on the anniversary of her gruesome deeds, she comes back and wanders the cemetery, humming the ominous wedding march and awaiting her next victim. I could have told the story much better than that, and you left out the most important part, that the anniversary of the horrible murders is tonight! I wonder if she'll actually appear! The only way we know for sure is to be here when it gets dark. As you would expect, all of the kids agree to meet up at the cemetery at sundown to see if the ghost bride actually shows up. Poor twisted little freak. So, what time do you guys want to meet up? Uh, Helga? It's kind of a boys only thing. Yeah, it's not for girls. Girls get scared too easy. What are you talking about? I won't get scared. No, no, no. It's a fella thing. Helga goes home very angry and decides to find a nice dress and some supplies, saying that she's going to scare the living hell out of the boys. We cut to all the boys at sundown, meeting at the cemetery. As they walk in, Helga shows up right behind them and shuts the gate chaining it shut and locking them all in. Here lies Cynthia Snip. She lived her life and went straight to... I can't read the rest. We see the kids getting unnerved as the sun starts to go down, though it's not actually dark yet. They all convince themselves that they've made it to sundown and that there's no ghost bride, so they're just gonna leave. Of course, they make it to the gate, and we see this happen. Ghost Bride, she did it! She's already picked us for her next victims! We're all gonna die. She's gonna hack us to pieces with her big bloody ass! Harold, take it easy. A guard must have locked it. Why don't we just cross the cemetery to the north gate and see if that's open? Yeah, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Can somebody carry me? As they walk through the cemetery, they hear the ghostly sound of someone humming that ominous wedding march. 
language at? It sounds like the wedding march. That's the same song the ghost bride was humming when she hacked her sister and almost husband in pieces. She's out there just waiting for us. It's probably just somebody visiting the cemetery who, uh, who just happens to be humming the wedding march. Hmm. It's not the ghost bride. The boys sprint away and they make it to the north gate, but right when they approach the gate, it closes and the lock bar falls into place. The boys freak out when the gate starts shaking profusely and they all run off, though we find out that it's just Helga pulling on the rope nearby. All we have to do is come up with a plan to get out of here. <gasps> it's her! She's coming with her big bloody axe! Eugene, cut it out. Sorry guys, it's just such a catchy tune. <laughs> We're all gonna die. It's okay. No, it's not. Cut it out, Eugene. It wasn't me. The ghost bride appears again, and they all sprint away while Helga laughs, calling them idiots for believing that the ghost bride is real. <laughs> I ought to pound you, Helga! I was just getting back at you for not letting me come along because I was a girl! But that's not important right now because I just saw the real Ghost Bride and she's right behind me! Helga tries to tell them that she saw the real Ghost Bride, but none of them believe her until they see it with their own eyes. The group runs and hides in a nearby mausoleum, which Gerald locks up using a shovel that he finds. Do you think she saw us? No. We're safe for now. Look, there she goes! She's not leaving! I think she knows we're in here! Maybe not. We just gotta wait until she goes away, and then we can get out! They all wait it out and watch out the window as the ghost bride keeps repeatedly walking around the perimeter of the mausoleum. Arnold ends up deciding that they can't just remain there like sitting ducks, and that they need to find a way out. Who's with me? Okay then, I'll go by myself. What? Don't be crazy, Arnold. The ghost bride will get you and hack you up just like her sister and her former intended. Well, we have to do something. We can't just stay in here forever. Sure we can. These guys did. <laughs> but they're dead. What's your point? Arnold ends up venturing out and he takes Gerald with him while everyone else stays behind and cowers in fear. They successfully hide from the ghost bride as she walks by, but when Arnold catches a close glimpse, he reveals that he isn't too sure that this is actually a ghost bride. such a dirty trick. I can't believe how nice you look in that dress. Curly reveals that he's angry because Gerald got to tell the story and that he thinks it's not fair, to which all of the kids decide that they're going to lock him inside of the mausoleum for the night. Arnold explains that he noticed Curly wearing red socks earlier and when the ghost bride walked by, he noticed those same exact red socks and he had a feeling that this was just the kind of prank that Curly would try to pull. I think we should uh, go back and let him out. Don't worry. It'll only take him about a half an hour to figure out that the door only locks from the inside. Helga, is that you? Come on, this isn't a joke. Let me out. Come on, Helga. Helga. One thing I love about these scary episodes of Hey Arnold is that they always leave you questioning your perception of things by the end of the episode. In The Haunted Train, at the end we see the same steam engine hauling ass down the tracks while the ghostly conductor is on the front, though it's already been revealed that that was all a made up story. In The Headless Cabbie, it was revealed that what the kids thought was the Headless Cabbie was actually Mr. Wynn and Ernie. But at the end, we see the same woman from that story entering the cabbie, ominously foreshadowing Ernie's death. Then, in this episode, we find out that the ghost bride isn't real and that it was just Helga and Curly pulling two separate pranks. 
However, at the very end, while Curly is alone, we hear the haunting sound of the Ghost Bride humming the wedding march, implying that there is a chance that the Ghost Bride does truly exist and that Curly might be her next victim. This episode, all things considered, was actually fantastic. It had the spooky horror element, a nice mystery with a plot twist, and it kept us as viewers very engaged throughout the whole thing. Helga playing a mean-spirited trick like that feels all too justified. The boys tried to exclude her for the simple fact that she's a girl, and as I touched on in my Dark Side of Hey Arnold video about Helga, that's a common issue that she faces. The boys exclude her sometimes because she is a girl, yet the girls exclude her sometimes because they don't think that she's girly enough. Honestly, if I was Helga, I probably would have pulled the same mean trick on them too. However, Curly on the other hand can just kind of fuck off. He was butt hurt because Gerald always gets to tell the stories, which Okay, in his defense, that is kind of unfair if you're really wanting to tell an urban legend, but like, Gerald is literally the group appointed keeper of the tales. He's always the one telling the urban legends, and that's his thing, and he's really good at it too. Curly was just being salty and decided to play a prank because he didn't get what he wanted. Curly didn't even do a good job of it either. At least Helga put some effort into it. She put on the makeup, she locked them in, she rigged the doors to shake, and she had a fun time chasing them around and terrorizing them. Curly, on the other hand, was just kind of lazy about it. He just kind of put on the dress and walked around with a croquet mallet or what the hell ever. It was overall just a low effort prank on his part, and it certainly could have been executed better. But what do you think? Do you think Curly was justified? More importantly, do you think that this is the scariest episode of Hey Arnold? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love reading your guys' feedback. If you enjoyed this video, do me a solid and drop a like and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it pushes this video to everyone else. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. My friends, spooky season is officially upon us. It's October and I am so ready to dive into some of the greatest Halloween specials and spooky episodes of all time. I've been looking forward to spooky season for what feels like forever now and I'm so happy that it's finally here, but I can't lie to you guys, this spooky season is going to be really different for me. It's going to take a lot of adjustment for me because, huge news, I'm moving. My house is officially sold as of the 26th of September, so I guess as of the time of me posting this, I am out of my house. It's weird to say that because as of the time that I'm recording this, I'm still living in my old house and the reality hasn't really fully set in that I'm leaving this place behind. I talked about this more in depth on Patreon, but I'm having a hard time with the move just a little bit. First of all, our new house doesn't close until about October 19th, so we're kind of displaced at my mom's house for a little while, but on top of that, though the house we're moving to is perfect for our needs and I'm so excited to live there, I'm struggling with the fact that I'm leaving behind the garage where this YouTube channel was born. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but hey, I'm a sentimental guy and it's weird to think that right now I'm recording some of the last videos that I will make in this house. October of 2020 is when all of this started and this month I celebrate three years of uploading videos on YouTube. It's been a wild ride and I'm thankful to be taking this journey with you guys, so I figured it's time we celebrate. There's just so much to be thankful for. I'm celebrating three years on YouTube, I'm going to be moving to a new state and leaving my day job so that I can work on YouTube full time. I'm going to be making a ton more long form content, multiple channels, merch, and maybe some live streams eventually at some point, I'm not sure about that though. This is the beginning of hopefully some big change for my channel. I'm reaching for the stars and I'm excited to see where we go from here. In honor of the occasion, I figured that there would be no better way to celebrate than to make a Dark Side of Hey Arnold interlude. A little taste, if you will, of things to come. The Dark Side of Hey Arnold is going to be a wild ride in the back half, and I can't wait for you guys to see where we go from here in the main series, but for now, we're going to touch briefly on what could possibly be one of the darkest episodes of Hey Arnold to ever air on Nickelodeon. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're checking out the episode of Hey Arnold called Four Eyed Jack. <laughs> Boys, 
dig up a severed hand in the cellar. Pretty good, Gerald. But I've got to read this one first. The Purdy Boys trapped in a mansion with a bunch of undead mummies. These books are sick. I love them. Hey, look at these, Gerald. As the boys are laughing, Arnold's grandpa comes in with a plate of cookies and some milk for them before the power goes out again. Whose glasses are these? <gasps> Bony Maroney! Those look like the glasses of Four-Eyed Jack. Four-Eyed Jack? Who's that? You never heard of Four-Eyed Jack? Well, give me one of them cookies and I'll tell you the story. Oh, this has got sparkles on it. Arnold's grandpa tells them of a weird guy that used to live in the boarding house long before either of them were born. He was called Four-Eyed Jack because of his need for glasses, due to the fact that he couldn't see more than four feet in front of himself. People pretty much left him alone here in the boarding house. He mostly kept to his room in his cellar cooking refried beans. Woohoo! They stank to high heaven! Jack had a notion to invent a new method of cooking him. Always experimenting on bigger and bigger batches of beans. Finally, he went too far. His pressure cooker exploded, and not a trace of Four Eyed Jack was ever found there again. Since then on, on every dark and stormy night, the ghost of Four Eyed Jack wanders around the boarding house as blind as a bat, looking for his lost glasses and moaning and muttering and crashing into things, spreading his awful stench and scaring the bejiminy out of people. You're telling me that this place is haunted? Well, no, that would be irresponsible. What I'm trying to say is, yes, it is haunted by the vengeful and holy crypt reeking ghost of Four Eyed Jack! Here you go, short man. You'll be hearing from him tonight, I'll wager. By moving these glasses, you've disturbed his spirit. I'll be hearing from him? Arnold suggests that maybe he was meant to find the glasses and give them back to Four-Eyed Jack so that he can finally move on and stop haunting the boarding house. Meanwhile, Gerald thinks that they should just put them back. Just then, Grandpa heads for the door as he's about to have an accident. I'll be in a commode. Your grandma made raspberry cobbler tonight. Oh, boy. I'd be careful with those glasses, short man. <laughs> Gerald just brushes all of it off and continues about his night trying to read a book, but Arnold is already up and investigating. He thinks that he's heard something go bump in the night, and he's convinced that it's Four-Eyed Jack looking for his glasses. Arnold starts to run downstairs, and Gerald begrudgingly follows him. Arnold thinks that just everything he's hearing is the ghost, even the squeaking of his bottom stair. I hear it, Gerald. It's louder than ever. He's real close! You were at the racetrack. I wasn't at the racetrack. I was looking for a job in the same neighborhood as the racetrack. No, I know you were at the racetrack. Hi, Mr. Kakashka. Oh, hello, Arnold. And uh, Arnold's friend. Gerald, he doesn't look like any fry jack to me, Arnold. I'd say he looks like a... Arnold asks Oscar if he's heard any weird noises recently, and just then they all hear some strange noise coming from down the hall. Oscar joins them as they go knocking on Ernie's door, wondering what the noise is that's coming from his room. Ernie just kind of looks at them weird for questioning him as Gerald starts telling Arnold to stop being crazy because there's no such thing as ghosts. Did you say ghost? Hey, not so fast, kid. Listen, Arnold. You don't want to disturb the spirits on a night like this. You don't want to mess with the unknown. I messed with the unknown one time. What happened? Nothing. But it could have been horrible. I could have been struck dead or turned to stone or something. Who knows? That's why they call it the unknown. Listen, if I was you boys, I'd turn back right now. Ernie tells them that for the last few nights, he's been hearing some really weird noises coming from downstairs. He says it sounds like someone's gagging on a hoagie. Arnold says that it must be Four-Eyed Jack, and they go down to investigate. I'll go first. This could get ugly. Hello! Yes! I told you it could get ugly. Mr. Wynn? 
Mr. Wayne tells them that he was just gargling, and Gerald continues on telling Arnold that he needs to calm down. All the meanwhile, Mr. Wynn is just confused by all this, and Arnold explains to him that they were all just looking for a ghost. Are you saying there's a ghost in the boarding house, Arnold? Well... When there is a ghost in the house, you need to give him an offering to make him go away! This chicken look good! Hey, that's my lunch! Give him the halibut. It's going bad anyway. <laughs> As lightning strikes above the house, we hear an ominous moaning from a weird secret tunnel behind the hall closet. The group heads down the tunnel and deep down into what looks like a stone dungeon with weird electronics all over the place, seemingly covered with bean splatter everywhere. They finally come upon the door where the moaning is coming from, but as Arnold reaches for the knob, Gerald suggests that they don't open it. Why not? Look, man, if you open that door and we find out what's behind it, then one of us will be right. So? So? One of us will be wrong. And what if it's me? Never eat raspberries, boys. Grandpa, what are you doing here? Grandpa explains to Arnold that he's using the downstairs bathroom that he keeps a secret from everyone else so that he can get his reading done. Arnold is blown away because he had no idea that this part of the house even existed. Meanwhile, much to Grandpa's dismay, everyone else is in awe of how clean and nice the secret bathroom is. They all start inspecting the bathroom as Gerald finally convinces Arnold once and for all that there is no ghost. Arnold finally seems to accept that fact as he switches off the light and we cut right to later on that night. The first thing that comes to mind fresh as this episode comes to an end is how in the world did nobody know that this bathroom existed? Like, Grandpa is the oldest person in the boarding house, so it would kind of make sense that no one else there would remember Four-Eyed Jack, as it could have been before their time there. But like, the concept of this area is weird because it implies that this area's been behind this closet Arnold's entire life, and he just, like, never noticed. That really just seems improbable, and I understand that I might be reading a little bit too far into it, but just saying, that really doesn't make sense. Honestly, it really sucks that Arnold didn't know that the area wasn't there because I can think of numerous instances where that would have been useful. For example, the episode where all the 5th graders are trying to shove Arnold and his classmates into garbage cans. If they had gotten to the boarding house, everyone could have just hidden down there and no one would have had any idea. Honestly, the idea of having an area like that hidden deep under your house is kinda cool. Honestly, the idea of having an area like- The idea of having an area like- Honestly, the idea of having an area like that hidden deep under your house is kinda cool. I'm sure they were just overdramatizing their journey down there, but they didn't make this seem like any normal basement. It was like a whole ass trek through a cave down there to get to this area. It was like its own little secret hidden spot under the house. It's kind of a bummer that this area is never really brought up again in future episodes, but it is what it is. Another thing I wanted to bring up before we get into the dark side of this episode is in the beginning where we see Arnold and Gerald hanging out and going through the books in this box. They're checking out the Purdy Boys books, which is a reference to the Hardy Boys, which is a book series about two brothers who solve mysteries together. This title, the Purdy Boys, being both a spoof of the Hardy Boys and a reference to one of the show's writers, Joseph Purdy. Another huge thing that I have to point out in this episode that I didn't notice the first few times I saw it is that part where Grandpa is telling the ghost story. He talks about how the old blind ghost of Four-Eyed Jack wanders the boarding house on stormy nights. 
We see his ghost attacking a pot of beans that's cooking on the stove. What I didn't realize though is that the woman who's being terrorized while cooking beans is a young Grandma Gertie. I do gotta say, this kind of frustrates me just a little bit. We don't see her appear at all throughout this episode other than this scene, and I think it would have been awesome to hear her side of this story and if she has any other stories of run-ins with the ghost. Honestly, more than anything, I just feel like that's a huge missed opportunity, but hey, that's just me. I love Arnold's grandma. She's so entertaining to me, and in my opinion, the more screen time she gets, the better. Moving on from there though, there's a lot of dark and ominous implications seen throughout this episode that we definitely have to talk about. First of all, we're gonna start with the most lighthearted of the bunch. That scene where Grandpa ominously tells Arnold to be careful with those glasses. He stands in the doorway and just stares intently at the boys as he requests Arnold heed his warning. Meanwhile, lightning is flashing and just amplifying every shadow that's hitting Grandpa's face. It's just so ominous and foreboding in a very dramatic way. Another thing I have to talk about before we get to the elephant in the room is Oscar and his wife Susie. Arnold and Gerald walk down the stairs from Arnold's room thinking that they're hearing the sound of Four-Eyed Jack's ghost looking for his glasses. They walk down the hall and follow the noise expecting maybe to find a ghost, but nope. It's just a heated domestic dispute complete with Susie throwing things at Oscar. This right here is just another great example of how serious this show can get while going over kids heads at the same time. I remember seeing this as a kid and it didn't even really register with me what was going on. Susie is literally shouting at Oscar and throwing stuff at him because he was lying to her. He's telling Susie that he wasn't at the racetrack and that he was just looking for a job in the area near the racetrack. All the meanwhile, she knows he's lying as someone literally told her that they saw him at the racetrack. This comes loaded with some seriously dark implications. First of all, them fighting in front of kids is just unacceptable. You, as an adult, should never let your fight spill over in front of children. You also shouldn't be throwing things in general. Violence is never the answer and throwing things is just kind of low, but especially not in front of children. On top of that, their argument is just a result of a bigger problem. Oscar has a gambling addiction. We've seen this come to light time and time again. He has screwed himself, Susie, and I'm pretty sure if I remember right, even Arnold on an occasion as a result of his gambling addiction. It's a massive problem and it's clearly causing a huge rift between him and his wife. Yet again though, this whole situation being a thing is an example of how Hey Arnold wasn't afraid to touch on these serious topics at any time. Moving on from there though, it's time we talked about the man himself, Four-Eyed Jack. As the story goes, he was a recluse who lived in the basement, cooking beans all day. As a result, he was really smelly and because of his obsession with cooking beans, he blew himself to bits and not even a piece of him was found. The way Grandpa tells it, a giant pressure cooker had exploded while Four-Eyed Jack was trying out a new method of cooking beans and he perished in the explosion. However, this is definitely a watered down cover up of the actual story in my opinion. What if I told you that Four-Eyed Jack was actually a drug addict? What if it wasn't beans that he was cooking down there? What if he was actually cooking meth or some other kind of awful drug? That would definitely explain quite a few things in my opinion. First of all, this guy is treated differently by everyone there. They all avoid him and he seems to have a rather weird demeanor in my opinion. This episode, from what little we see, portrays him as a mad chemist of sorts. His odd demeanor could be explained by his extreme drug use. You know that if he's the one cooking it and he's using it, he's probably using a ton of it. So odds are, he's probably high as a kite at all times. Furthermore, it would definitely explain the way that his weird little hideout down there was more of like a chemistry lab than a kitchen. If he was making nothing but beans, you'd see mostly kitchen appliances and stuff down there, not vials and other chemist supplies. Beans aren't that complex to be honest. You don't need all these kinds of different supplies to cook something as simple as refried beans. It's rather suspicious if you ask me. On top of all that, him cooking and using drugs would definitely explain the smell. I've been told that meth smells like rotten eggs and cat pee, which sounds extremely unpleasant. Now, I've got a few running theories as to what happened with good old Four-Eyed Jack. 
first, I'm thinking that maybe what Grandpa said was true, except instead of a trying a new method of heating up beans explosion, it was more of a trying a new method of cooking meth explosion. If not that, I'm thinking maybe he was just an old smelly tweaker that got evicted and they just never really cleaned out his area, except for the bathroom so Grandpa could use it. I do gotta say, I can't help but notice that the bathroom that Grandpa Phil is using just so happens to be in the same exact spot that the pressure cooker was in the story. So maybe, just maybe, the pressure cooker was never really there. It could be gathered by that logic that maybe 4 -Eyed Jack overdosed and his body was taken out by the coroner or the DME and Grandpa is just making up this story to lighten it to share it with the children. I'm not sure what the actual case is in the death of 4 -Eyed Jack. Maybe Grandpa Phil is telling the truth and that's really how it went down. However, it can be inferred that the writers, at bare minimum, are making a reference to drug use and manufacturing. There's one big thing that I find myself wondering at the end of all this though, and that would be, is 4-Eyed Jack's ghost real? Usually episodes like this end in a way that leaves it kind of vague and makes you question everything that you saw. However, this episode's ending is very straightforward. 4-Eyed Jack's ghost goes floating into Arnold's room looking for his glasses. He finds them, and we see his vision finally clear once and for all. Being brought to peace with his glasses, 4-Eyed Jack is finally able to assume his actual form as a spirit as he appears to Gerald before seemingly moving on to the other side. That right there also is a huge deal. Gerald is literally the only person that saw 4-Eyed Jack's ghost in his actual form. He appeared to Gerald the one person who didn't believe in him, and no one else. What's really gnarly about that too, is that Gerald is just a kid. That's something that he's gonna hold on to for the rest of his life. This kid just saw a ghost moments before it passed on, and he's the only one who can ever actually say that he saw that particular ghost. That's enough to petrify you and cause you some trauma that'll follow you for life. At the end of this episode, I find myself questioning if 4-Eyed Jack's ghost is real, but Gerald saw it with his own eyes, so it must be real, right? Regardless, I can't lie to you guys, that's one of my biggest fears. Waking up to an actual legit ghost standing over my bed and looking at me is something that would petrify me to my core. But then again, I've lived in an actual haunted house before, however, that's a story for a different video. But what do you think? Do you think the story of 4-Eyed Jack is a tragic one? Also, are you excited for more long form content and dark side of Hey Arnold? Let me know in the comments down below, I always love seeing your guys' feedback, and of course I- Wait, do, do you hear that? <coughs> Ouch! Ugh. 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 Huh? Oh yeah, patrons. Yes, patrons, especially in the 90s kids tier. You guys rock. Thank you so much for supporting me directly and making a huge change in my life. I'm going to be moving into a new house very soon and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, you guys. You patrons have helped me a ton with this process on multiple occasions. So again, thank you so much. If you enjoyed this video, do me a huge solid and leave me a comment letting me know what you think and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it shares this video with everyone else. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Hey everyone, so really quick before we get into the video, I have to give a really important shout out. I want to give a massive thank you to Ian Michael T 640 who gave me a $5 super thanks on my video about cat dogs seeing the end of the world. They're the first person to give me a super thanks, and I just wanted to say that I appreciate that so much. I turned that option on a few months back and never really said anything because I don't want to push, and honestly, I don't want anyone to feel pressured to donate, but I can't can't tell you how much I appreciate your kindness. It's an honor to be able to share my videos with you guys, and I'm so thankful for you clicking on this video and for being a part of my YouTube journey. I'm not gonna sit here and push the super thanks every video, but if you want to support me directly and get a shout out as well, feel free to buy one. When I first started my Dark Side of Hey Arnold series, I knew that it was going to be a long journey. I knew that I wanted to pick through these characters with a fine tooth comb. 
There was one piece of the puzzle that I had a really hard time figuring out when planning this series though, and that would be the Christmas episode. You know the one that I'm talking about. Ever since the inception of The Dark Side of Hey Arnold, I've had numerous people in the comments requesting that I cover this episode, and I've honestly struggled to figure out how to do it. I thought about including it in a video about Mr. Wynn, or maybe another intense video that I have planned later on in the series, but the thing is, this episode encompasses so much more than just one character. I feel like I could have included this one in my video about Helga because it shows a lot about her true character, but then again, it focuses around Mr. Wynn, so I feel like it should be in a video dedicated to him. But then again, Arnold does the brunt of the heavy lifting in this episode. Ultimately, it felt like this episode needed a video of its own. There's just so much for us to unpack here, and I feel like lumping this episode in with a video talking about other episodes just wouldn't do it justice. This episode is one that is truly different than the rest of the series, and I feel like it deserves to stand on its own and get its own video. Outside of where to put it in the series, I also struggled to talk about this episode because I've already done it before. Years ago I made a video about Nicktoons Christmas specials, and this one was included in it. However, when I made that video, my audience was like 1 16th the size of what it is now. It's interesting to look back at that video because the way I tackled things was a lot different back then. I'll link that one down in the description box below so you can check it out after this one if you want. In the background, I've been working very hard on the next true 1 to 3 hour Dark Side of Hey Arnold video, and it's coming along amazing, but in the meantime, I figured we could use one more holiday interlude in the series. Considering that we had one for Halloween back in October. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're gonna look at what I would claim to be the most emotionally gripping Christmas episode of all time, Arnold's Christmas. winter day with snow scattered about, we see the kids of PS 118 run out of school as the bell rings to dismiss them for winter break. We see Phoebe and Helga walking down the street, while Phoebe shares how thankful she is for all the beautiful Christmas decorations around town. She asks Helga what her favorite part of Christmas is. The presents! I'm gonna make a haul this year! But Helga, Christmas is about giving and sharing, family and friends, holiday spirit. Oh, come off your high horse, sister! Christmas is about presents. It's about getting as much stuff as you can possibly get. It's about money and flesh. It's about shopping like a barbarian. It's about getting yours before the other guy gets his. It's about dropping hands, making lists. Christmas is about... Snow boots. Helga runs right up to the display for this year's hottest fashion statement, the Nancy Spumoni Signature Snow Boots. Hand riveted and made with imported leather, Helga says that she just has to have them. Just then, Rhonda walks up to point out that same goes for literally every other girl in town. She says that the stores are practically sold out. I'll get my boots, Rhonda Lloyd. I've been dropping hints to my parents for weeks, and they better not blow it, or I'll show them some holiday spirit. It's a rather small thing, but fun fact, this scene right here is actually how Rhonda ended up getting her last name. At this point, she hadn't gotten one yet, but Helga calling her Rhonda Lloyd as an insult is what cemented her last name being Lloyd. We cut right on over to Arnold and Gerald walking out of a shop. Arnold asks Gerald what he got for his family for Christmas, and he says that he got his dad a tie, he got his brother a tie, and he even got his little sister a tie. You can't give Kimberly a tie for Christmas. She's a little four-year-old girl. What's she gonna wear a tie for? On my occasion. You can't just give everybody a tie for Christmas. Why not? Because Christmas is special. It's about showing the people you're close to that you really care about them. When you give somebody a present, it should be unique. Well, maybe you're right. Maybe I'll give my grandpa the tie I got for Kimberly. And I get her a toy or something. Now you're getting the Christmas spirit. Gerald says bye to Arnold, and Arnold asks him where he's going, to which he says that he's got to return Arnold's present, assuming that he got Arnold a tie too. As the two part ways, Helga catches sight of Arnold as she starts talking about how he's such a holiday sap and she hates him. How I revile his very existence. And yet, 
I love him. His awkward gait, his half-lidded gaze, his brave, if misguided, concern for those less fortunate. I must find the perfect gift for my beloved. Something big and flashy. Something that'll impress him and make him pine for me the way I pine for him. Back over at the boarding house, we see Mr. Wynn walking in with a rather somber look on his face. He walks right into the living room as Arnold's grandma wishes everybody a happy Thanksgiving. They all gather around as they prepare to draw names for Secret Santa. Go ahead, everybody. Pick a random name from the ball. Don't tell anyone, but I got Oscar. I got Oscar, too. So did I. <laughs> what a coincidence. Kakashka, you bum. You wrote your name on all the slips. Okay, okay, it was a joke. Arnold's grandpa scalds Oscar for being a yuletide prankster, and we see him take over for Secret Santa, having everybody redraw. Mr. Wynn. Later that night, we see Arnold, Gerald, and the rest of the kids in the neighborhood having a snowball fight. Arnold confides in Gerald, telling him that he has no idea of what to get Mr. Wynn, and as you'd expect, Gerald suggests that he get Mr. Wynn a tie. Arnold just refuses, saying that's everyone's default gift when they don't know what to get someone. Arnold wants to put some genuine thought into his gift and really make a difference. He tells Gerald that he noticed that Mr. Wynn seems to get really sad near the holidays, so he wants to try to get him a gift that will hopefully help cheer him up. Well, if you really want to find out what the guy wants, why don't you just go talk to him? Yeah, I'll just go talk to him. Gather some clues. Figure out what he wants. What a great plan, Gerald! We cut right on over to Mr. Wynn's living room, where we see him sitting on a stool and talking to Arnold, who's on the couch. Arnold tries to play it cool, saying that he just wanted to check in on him and see how he's doing. Mr. Wynn tells him that he's fine. We see Arnold trying to dig for ideas of what to get him, but the conversation doesn't really get anywhere with Arnold going the roundabout way. It's almost Christmas time. Yes, this type of year always make me remember. Remember what? It was a long time ago, Arnold. A very complicated story. I'd like to hear it. Please tell me. Many years ago, I lived in another country, far away. I was a young man with a family, a beautiful baby girl. I call her my. Mr. Wynn continues to reflect on that time, saying that he was the luckiest man in the world to have such a happy, healthy daughter. He tells Arnold about how late at night he used to dream of their future and seeing her grow up and go to school someday. But there was a trouble in my country. There was a war in the north, and every day the fighting was coming closer and closer. I knew this would not be a good place for my child to grow up. I could not keep her safe. Maybe not even have enough food for her to eat. So I decided we must try to get out. We must try to find a better life. Everyone was trying to get out. Everywhere there was confusion. Mr. Wynn explains how he made it to the American Embassy and the only escape possible was by helicopter. He went atop the building to find a crowd of people all desperate to get out of the war-torn country and begging to get on the helicopter. As Mr. Wynn begs them to help him find a new life for his baby girl, the soldiers close the door, saying that they only have room for one more person on board. Heartbroken and desperate for help, Mr. Wynn looks at Mai and holds her close to him for the last time. I had to make the most difficult decision of my life. I knew I had to do the best thing for Mai. I knew if I gave my to the soldier, they would take care of her. They would find a home for her. And then, as soon as I could, I would get out of the country and find her again. As the helicopter left, the soldier called out the name of a city. This city. Arnold empathizes with Mr. Wynn, assuring him that he did the right thing, considering that he literally had no other choice. Mr. Wynn explains that it took him 20 years before he could finally get out of the country, and he came to this city looking for her because that's where he was told they would take her. He's been looking for her ever since, and it's been such a hard battle for him. Sometimes it is so difficult 
I almost give up hope. But I never stop thinking about her. I will never stop trying. I would give anything to see her again, to know that she is happy. We cut to the next day where Arnold is walking with Gerald who's calling him absolutely crazy for thinking that he could possibly find Mr. Wynn's daughter. Arnold tells him that this is really important to him and that he really wants to make sure that Mr. Wynn has a good Christmas. Gerald stresses to him that it's the day before Christmas and that there are tons of people in this city. He says there's absolutely no way that they're going to be able to track down one person in that little time. We then cut right over to Helga who's digging through a bin at a toy store looking for a good gift to give Arnold. She's struggling because she wants to get him something that's flashy and really big. A deluxe 240 piece train set, complete with autumn foliage, collapsible bridge, and one-legged Bob the Affable Railroad Tramp. No, too juvenile. Arnold's too mature for that. Think, Helga, think! What would Arnold want for Christmas? Here it is. Here what is? I've been on the phone all morning, calling every government agency in town, and everything led me to this place. Federal Office of Information? Somewhere in this building is the information we need to find Mr. Wynn's daughter. Arnold and Gerald walk through the halls of this building and they quickly learn that all of the employees are enjoying their annual Christmas party and no one's really working. Arnold continues on, determined to find someone who's still working at this hour on Christmas Eve. They come across one lone office door that still has the light on. They approach the door labeled Mr. Bailey, Department Supervisor. Excuse me, Mr. Bailey? What are you two kids doing here? Nobody's allowed in here. Can't you see I'm busy? We're looking for a missing person named Mai Wen. We think she lives somewhere in the city. So what do you want me to do about it? Uh, we thought you could find her for us. Please? She was separated from her father by a war. He's a really good guy. He's a friend of mine. I want to bring them together for Christmas. And what a... Perfect Christmas present, don't you think, Mr. Bailey? He tells the boys that their story has touched him deeply, but finding Mai would be a massive job and would probably take days. He tells them that there's no way it's going to happen on Christmas Eve and that they should just go enjoy the party that's happening down the hall. The boys start to walk out of Mr. Bailey's office as his phone rings. Arnold and Gerald overhear him having a conversation with his wife about how it's Christmas Eve and he still hasn't done any of their Christmas shopping because he's so swamped with work. Mr. Bailey promises his wife that he's going to get the shopping done somehow. What if Gerald and me did your Christmas shopping for you? Huh? What? I'm going to trust you kids with my Christmas shopping? Yeah. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna give 300 bucks to a couple of nine-year-old kids. How else are you gonna get it done on time? Mister, I'd do anything to get Mr. Wynn and his daughter together. I'll do your shopping, you can trust me. I'll come back, no matter what. Okay, you got yourself a deal. I hate shopping anyway. Mr. Bailey hands the money over to Arnold and says that if he gets everything on the list back here before closing, then he will try to run a purse and search for Mai. Arnold takes the list with a huge smile on his face and heads on out to get some shopping done. We get a nice montage of Arnold and Gerald going through the mall and many other places, buying all of the presents and paying to have them wrapped. Everything goes smooth as butter and we see them finally stop to sit down for a sec as they review their list. At this point, they're both excited to be down to one last item, a pair of official Nancy Spumoni snow boots. Clearly unaware of the fact that those are one of the hottest gifts of the year and the stores are sold out of them. As the boys continue on, we see Helga excitedly holding what she believes to be the perfect, flashy, and expensive gift for Arnold. On Christmas morn, he will unwrap my gift. His little heart will fill with joy. His little eyes will find the attached tag to Arnold from Helga, and his uniquely football-shaped head will fill with thoughts about me, Helga Pataki, and perhaps then those same thoughts will lead him to feel the same admiration and... Dare I say it's love for me that I have so long and secretly harbored for him. <sighs> this truly must be the meaning of Christmas. Just then, Helga turns around and she sees Arnold and Gerald walking straight towards her. They say hi to her and they ask her what she's getting. She shows them the game that she's buying and she asks if they think someone would be really impressed if they got that gift. To which Gerald explains, Well, I 
don't know, Helga. Basically, it's kind of an expensive flashy gift that isn't really personal and doesn't necessarily express any real feeling or understanding of the person you might be giving it to. No offense, Helga. Gerald, we better get going. Merry Christmas, Helga. <sighs> Snow boots? After that, we see Arnold and Gerald asking a guy in a shoe store about Nancy Spumoni snow boots. He tells Arnold to hang on for a sec, and he ends up coming back with a few other employees. Go ahead, kid. Tell us what you want. A pair of Nancy Spumoni snow boots. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. What's so funny? Oh, we've been sold out of those boots for a month. But in all, in all seriousness, if you want to put your name on a waiting list, uh, I could get you a pair of by, oh, say, the 4th of July. <laughs> the employees all laugh Arnold and Gerald out of the store, and we get a montage of them feeling defeated as they go from store to store, getting laughed out of the building every time. Arnold ends up looking at a nearby clock tower, noting that the government office is about to close and that they're out of time. Gerald says they just need to go back to the office, tell Mr. Bailey that they couldn't find the boots, and hope for the best. No snow boots? Look, kid, we made a deal. You get everything on the list, and then I find your missing person. But we tried. We looked everywhere. We must have looked in over a hundred shoe stores. Listen, boys. My wife specifically told me to get Nancy Spumoni snow boots for our daughter. I gotta have those snow boots. No snow boots, no deal. The boys walk out of the office sad as Mr. Bailey answers another call and continues on about his work. Arnold and Gerald sit down at a nearby bench, feeling broken down and defeated. Arnold admits that he feels like he blew it. All he had to do was get a pair of Nancy Spumoni snow boots to Mr. Bailey at the federal office and he would find Mr. Wynn's daughter, but it's no snow boots, no deal. He tells Gerald that he's really thankful to him for sticking by his side through all of this, like a true friend. I needed a miracle, I guess. You did all right, man. You tried harder than anyone else I know. All for Mr. Wynn, a guy who's alone in this country. The stuff you did is more important than a bunch of presents. It's more important than some dumb snow boots. What you did, that's what Christmas is all about, Arnold. Thanks, Gerald. Just wish I could have put Mr. Wynn and his daughter together for Christmas. We then cut over to Helga's house as she returns home to find her parents both singing very obnoxiously as her older sister Olga is playing Christmas songs on the piano. As Helga sits on the couch looking depressed, her mother comes up and asks her if she wants to open an early present to cheer her up. She sits up and opens the box to find none other than a pair of Nancy Spumoni snow boots. We learn that Miriam, in a rather out of character act of kindness, stood in line for 18 hours to get those boots. We see Helga and her mother share a heartwarming moment together as Helga gives her a huge hug and thanks her for the boots. Helga then excitedly runs outside to take the boots for a spin out in the snow. She dances around and has the time of her life, having finally gotten the one thing that she wanted more than anything else on her list. She continues to celebrate until she catches sight of Mr. Bailey's Christmas shopping list that fell out of her pocket. She stops dead in her tracks and has to take a moment to dig through her emotions and morals. Not another moral dilemma. <sighs> okay. On the one hand, I've got what I wanted for Christmas. I'm happy, and that's really all that matters, right? But on the other hand, I've finally discovered the one perfect thing Arnold wants for Christmas. And through a truly bizarre quirk of fate, it's these same snow boots. I could give them up and give Arnold what he wants, but then I wouldn't have anything. <laughs> these snow boots are really boss. As Helga contemplates what the right thing to do would be, we cut over to Arnold, who's laying in bed, staring up at the night sky, and feeling emotionally drained. We cut over to the Federal Building, where the lights are shutting off for the night, and Mr. Bailey is the last person to go home. Helga runs right up to him and gives him her pair of Nancy Spumoni snow boots, telling him that they have a missing person to find. 
However, he refuses, saying that he's going home because it's Christmas Eve. We then hear Helga contradict everything she said in the beginning of this episode, telling Mr. Bailey that Christmas isn't about snow boots, presents, or getting yours before the other guy gets his. It's about showing people that you care, and most of all, it's about a funny little football-headed kid who's got a good heart and his entire worldview is at stake. Mr. Bailey says that it's late and that he's going home now. For pity's sake, are you that cold? Look into your heart, and we've got a choice here. Either you and I work all night to find a certain lost daughter, or you can leave now. But if you leave now, that little football-headed kid will never believe in miracles again. We then cut over to the boarding house on Christmas morning. Everyone full of cheer, save for Mr. Wynn and Arnold, who's sitting sadly nearby when Gerald comes up and wishes him a Merry Christmas. Grandpa finishes handing out presents to everyone, including a new hammer for Ernie and a bag of coal for Oscar. However, the Yuletide joy seems to come to a halt when everyone realizes that there isn't a gift for Mr. Wynn under the tree. Mr. Wynn is quick to brush it off, saying that it's okay and that he doesn't need a gift. Arnold sadly gets up and walks over to Mr. Wynn, saying that he has something to tell him. Just then, his sentence is interrupted by a ring of the doorbell. I'm coming, lousy Yuletide pranksters. For the first time in over 20 years, Mr. Wynn holds his daughter in his arms in awe that she's really there. With a huge smile on his face, Mr. Wynn introduces his daughter to his new boarding house family as Arnold wishes him a Merry Christmas. Arnold talks to Gerald, just bewildered at how it happened. He says that it doesn't make any sense. Don't try to make sense out of it, Arnold. A miracle's a miracle, and that's all there is to it. Maybe you got a Christmas angel looking out for you or something. Christmas angel? Yeah, maybe. Merry Christmas, Arnold. I gotta be honest with you guys, this ending really hits me a lot harder than it did years ago when I made that last video about this episode. Seeing Helga standing outside of Arnold's house wishing him a Merry Christmas in the end was just the final gut punch that this episode really needed. At this point in the series, we didn't have as much established lore and understanding of Helga as a character. However, knowing what we know now about Helga, her upbringing, and how her parents treated her during her early childhood, this act of kindness towards Arnold just lands completely differently. In the Dark Side of Hey Arnold video I made about Helga, I went in great detail about her upbringing and how at a very sensitive and formative time in her life when she felt like no one cared about her, Arnold was the only one to show some care and compassion for her. She had the sad and unfortunate experience of hitting rock bottom as a preschool aged child, feeling like her parents cared about her sister more as they were too busy fawning over her to take Helga to school and make sure that she was dry and safe. During that time though, Arnold was the sweet little boy who not only shielded her from the rain, but complimented her on her outfit. I dive into it a lot more in depth in that video, but more or less, he was pretty much the first person to see Helga for who she truly is before she felt the need to put on this big tough bully persona. With that added context, it makes the gesture of her giving up her favorite Christmas present for him a truly meaningful one. That combined with the fact that she also did it in secret. Arnold has no idea how it happened. He has no idea who did it, and to Helga, that's okay. Because for her, she realizes that it's not about getting the glory of having done this. For her, this is a lot bigger. In Helga's mind, doing things like this for Arnold to preserve his worldview is largely about preserving that innocent, sweet little boy who saved her during her time of need. 
Unfortunately, her worldview was skewed a long time ago. However, her meeting Arnold was a much needed light in her life. Naturally, she doesn't want his light to fade, so she does everything she can to preserve his positivity and not to have his worldview end up skewed like hers was as a result of her being neglected as a young child. What's definitely worth noting though is that this light in her life is something that continues to shine all throughout this series. In this episode, we see that same light light up her life in the sense that it altered her perception of Christmas. Throughout this episode, we see Helga struggle to pick a present for Arnold because she's thinking like herself and not putting herself in his shoes. She immediately jumps to get a flashy toy or a super expensive video game, however, if she would just stop for a sec and put herself in Arnold's shoes, she would know that's not what he wants. However, through the process of her following Arnold and eavesdropping on his conversations, she was able to put the pieces together of what he was doing, and that made her stop and consider Arnold as a person as well as his character. Through that process, she would learn the true meaning of Christmas. At the start of the episode, we would hear her talk about how it's all about the gifts and getting yours before the other guy gets his, but by the end, she's telling Mr. Bailey that Christmas is really about caring for other people and that gifts don't matter. It's an interesting concept to digest because throughout this episode, we would hear Arnold trying to teach Gerald this same lesson due to the fact that he was buying everyone ties for Christmas. He explained to Gerald the true meaning of Christmas, and it got to the point where, ironically, Gerald was the one explaining to Helga in the store that her idea of getting a video game was really shallow and seemed like a gift bought just for the price tag. However, whereas Gerald had to be explained that lesson, Helga was able to learn it just by simply perceiving Arnold and trying to help him accomplish his goal in secret. It was like a breath of fresh air seeing Helga come to that conclusion on her own through her own actions in helping Arnold. All of this is obvious, I know, but it just really warmed my heart. This episode is one that's really heavy on the emotions, and Helga's part in all of it just really felt like a big glowing positive that I wanted to address right out the gate because it's gonna get a lot harder from here if I'm being honest. This episode is a really somber reminder to hug your loved ones close, especially if you're a parent. If there's any message I could choose to spread in this video, it's not to take your life for granted even when things get really hard. There's a lot going on in the world right now. A lot of people are struggling worldwide. We go through hardship and just because someone else's hardship may seem worse than yours, that doesn't make your struggles any less valid. We're all in this boat together, and though life can get really hard, it's crucial to take a second to think about what you have to be thankful for. The holidays can be a really hard and sensitive time for a lot of people. If you aren't able to physically hold your loved ones close, or if you don't have loved ones for whatever reason, I want you to know that I'm really happy that you're here. I'm happy that I have the opportunity to talk with you and reflect on this episode with you, and I appreciate you being here, and I hope that watching this video is able to help spark some joy. Personally, this episode is a hard one for me. I love both of my parents very much, and I value the relationship that I have with them. I've talked about this before in a past video, but my dad has had brain cancer since I was a young kid. He's gone in and out of remission throughout my life, but right now, he's going through it really hard. With me having recently moved really far away from him, it makes episodes like this one hurt really bad if I'm being honest. Being separated from a parent is a really hard thing to do, and I miss my parents every day. The depiction of what happened between Mr. Wynn and his daughter in this episode is incredibly heavy. You can tell how much he loved his daughter when he reflects on the life that they used to live in their village. The way he talks about how he would stay awake at night dreaming about their future together just broke my heart. The portrayal of Mr. Wynn's situation though is one that was a really sad truth for a lot of people. The reference here being to the Vietnam War, which is known for being one of the longest wars in American history going from 1955 to 1975. I remember learning about it in school, however, not only was I an irresponsible teenager who was just remembering it to get an A and not actually digesting what I was learning, but learning about this kind of stuff from what teachers can show a whole group of kids in school doesn't have as large of an impact as doing your own individual research online does, in my opinion. 
A lot of really awful war crimes occurred during this war, and a lot of it is very well documented. There were massacres, terrorist attacks, and even sexual assault on innocent civilians, as well as widespread torture and murder of prisoners of war. There are many famous historical images online of executions, mass murder, and unspeakable war crimes. The one that really broke me though is an image that I won't be showing, titled The Terror of War by Nick Oot. It's an image that won a Pulitzer Prize for its depictions of how horrific this war was. The image would show a nine-year-old little girl running down the street with no clothes, covered in burns from a napalm strike. This picture would cause waves in the media and was a terrifying expression of how innocent people were suffering and not even children were safe. For context, if you're not familiar, after this photo was taken, the photographer, who was 21 at the time, would take the little girl to get medical attention, and she's now a fully grown adult who keeps in contact with him. But this is just a small glimpse into the horrors of this war that Mr. Wynn was trying to raise his daughter through. The war was ravaging Vietnam, and the timeline of this episode lines up with the fall of Saigon, which was the climax of the Vietnam War. The United States had sent helicopters to rescue South Vietnamese citizens, and there was only so much space. Mr. Wynn knew that his daughter was in danger if she were to continue to live there with him, and unfortunately, this led to him having to make the hardest decision that he's ever had to make. It hurts a lot, and it's a double-edged sword because honestly, Mr. Wynn is lucky for having the option to make that decision. If he wasn't able to give Mai to those soldiers, she may not have survived. He was saving her life by making that choice, as painful as it was for him. This would haunt Mr. Wynn for years to come. It hurts knowing that he had to sacrifice what was most important to him in exchange for that same thing to continue to thrive. Understanding the context of this war and what he was up against makes his somber staring into the fire hurt so much more. Knowing that he's carrying so much pain inside of him from missing so much time with his daughter just makes the emotional baggage of this episode so much heavier to carry. Now, Arnold's role in all of this is one that really just speaks volumes to him as a person. Arnold is a great person through and through. I'm really happy that he of all people got Mr. Wynn for Secret Santa. Given the history established in the show, we all know that Mr. Wynn has lived in the boarding house for at least a few years now. Other people have obviously gotten him for Secret Santa in the past, and odds are, those same people probably got him a cop-out gift like a tie. Or maybe a sweater, considering that he has a whole closet full of them. However, Arnold, on the other hand, isn't a superficial person like that. He's not getting Mr. Wynn a whatever gift just because he was assigned to get him a present. Arnold was set on getting him something that really mattered to him and made a difference. The reason behind that being that odds are, Arnold might be the first person to really take the time to actually notice Mr. Wynn struggling and how sad he gets at this time of year. If not that, the only other explanation I can think of is that everyone else notices that he's sad but they choose to not try and talk to him about it because they just don't know what it's like. They know that he's the kind Vietnamese man who immigrated here in the 90s, and that's about it. Odds are, they can assume that he struggled surviving in a war-torn country, however, none of them have been through anything close to that, so they don't know how to approach it. The only one who's experienced anything even remotely close to that is Grandpa Phil, who was a World War II vet, and that's literally the smallest thread of understanding, considering that he was actually fighting in the war that his side ended up winning. Mr. Wynn, on the other hand, was an innocent civilian affected by the war, so of course, even Grandpa Phil would likely have trouble relating to that struggle. The fact that Arnold would take the time to not only empathize with Mr. Wynn, but also jump through so many hoops to reunite him with his long-lost daughter really attests to his character. I can't imagine any of this is easy on Arnold either. He struggles with his own version of that kind of pain, considering that his own parents are no longer around. I'd imagine that Arnold wishes more than anything that his parents could come home for Christmas, however, that's unfortunately out of his control. On the other hand, reuniting Mr. Wynn with his daughter is something that Arnold knew could be a reality with enough determination. 
Arnold taking part in bringing the two together is symbolic in a way. When Helga talked to Mr. Bailey about how him not being willing to help could end up with Arnold not believing in miracles ever again, I feel like that statement was so much bigger than the actual words that came out of her mouth. At face value, yes, Arnold would feel very defeated if he was unable to help Mr. Wynn be reunited with his daughter. But in a way, I feel like Helga recognizes the fact that Arnold being able to witness that miracle for Mr. Wynn gives him hope for his own miracle someday, in the sense that maybe his parents will come back and he'll be reunited with them just like Mr. Wynn was with Mai. To her, this is so much bigger than a man being reunited with his daughter after more than 20 years. This is also about the single light in her life not having his own light dulled. In this episode, there were acts of kindness all around, and it was really heartwarming. However, there was one specific person who was kind of a massive downer through the whole thing, and that's going to be none other than Mr. Bailey. This man is so frustrating. He told them that he would try to search for their missing person when they get back near closing time, which kind of implies that at the end of the day when they got back, he'll give it a quick try. However, previously he said that it would take days to find her. The inconsistency in his story is really frustrating because I figured if it really took that long, he should probably be working on that while they're off doing his Christmas shopping for him. On that note though, how messed up is that? This guy literally handed $300 over to a couple of 9 year olds and made them do all of his Christmas shopping around town. Which, might I add, he should have done ages ago. It's Christmas Eve and he's the one who neglected to do any shopping. However, even more messed up than tasking literal children to do his fatherly work for him is the fact that when they did it all, he straight up refused to help them because they were missing one single item. He put it so incredibly black and white that he was basically setting them up to fail from the start. I also couldn't help but wonder if he knew that the boots are sold out. Like, I wouldn't put it past him to make this deal with these kids knowing good and well that they wouldn't be able to get the boots. That way, it's an easy out for him to not have to help them and he gets all of his Christmas shopping done for him. It's a win-win for him if you look at it that way. Even if that's not the case, he should be a little more understanding if we're being honest. It's not like they didn't get the boots because they forgot they just simply weren't available and even if Mr. Bailey himself had done all of his own shopping, he wouldn't have been able to get a pair of the boots anyways. It just felt like they jumped through all of these hoops for him and he was incredibly ungrateful. They saved him so much time and he wasn't even willing to say that he would help them after Christmas. Of course, by the end, it's implied that Helga ends up convincing him to do it, but we never really get that happy scene with him coming around to the true meaning of Christmas like we did with the other characters. If there's anything else glaring that really sticks out about this special, it would be the fact that it didn't need magic or Santa to make a big difference. Don't get me wrong, I love Santa as much as the next guy, but a lot of these cartoon holiday specials end up having the plot resolved with a Christmas miracle that can only be explained with Santa's magic. However, this special was very human. There wasn't anything here that was open to interpretation, and there was no unexplained gaps to us as viewers, and that, in my opinion, is a true testament to how great this show did with expressing these regular everyday kids and their lives. Even in the Christmas episode where they would be perfectly justified in explaining my showing up as a miracle granted by Santa, they chose instead to make it about the core characters learning lessons and doing nice things for each other. The beauty of this is that to Arnold, this is a true Christmas miracle. He doesn't know how it happened or who granted the miracle, but it happened. For all he knows, it could have been Santa Claus himself. To him, it doesn't matter how. What matters is that Mr. Wynn got to have the best Christmas that he's had in over 20 years. Arnold was willing to do whatever it took to make that happen, and he did literally everything he could. It was heartbreaking to see Arnold so sad on Christmas morning. 
He felt like a complete failure, which is just so incredibly sad, considering that he spent so much of his time trying to put this together for Mr. Wynn. That scene at the end, where Arnold is left wondering how this happened, was just so incredibly heartwarming. Little did he know, there was a warm soul just outside the door who selflessly gave up the one thing she wanted just to keep his light glowing and to help him grant his Christmas miracle. I have to ask though, what do you guys think? Did this episode bring you to tears like it did for me? Do you look back at this one fondly? Let me know in the comments down below, I always love seeing your guys' feedback. Massive thank you and a happy holidays to my patrons, but especially those in the true 90s kids tier. You all are the absolute best. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to drop a like and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it pushes this video to everyone else, and as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace. Thank you.